Subcommittee will come to order. Before we begin, I want to raise a small piece of old business. Uh, during the member day hearing uh, last week, we committed to include Representative Posey's testimony in the record uh, because he was unable to attend. Uh, because of the press of time and votes, we did not ask unanimous consent to do that during the hearing. Uh, similarly, uh, it had been our intention to ask unanimous consent to include the written testimony of former NIFA Administrator Dr. Sonny Ramaswamy uh, in the hearing last week on relocation, uh, but he also uh, failed to do that. Uh, I'd like to accommodate both of these with a uh, unanimous consent request. Uh, this has been cleared with the minority staff, and I ask unanimous consent to include both testimonies in their respective hearing transcripts. Uh, without objection, so ordered. Now, good morning, and let me welcome all of you to today's hearing. Uh, this morning, we are examining the state of the rural and farm economies through the lens of farm credit. We have two panels to help us understand the challenges and the opportunities that our farmers, ranchers, producers, and rural communities are facing. The first panel uh, consists of two members of the Farm Credit Administration Board, Dallas Tonsager, who is the chairman and CEO of Farm Credit Association Administration, and Jeffrey Hall, who is a board member and chairman of the Farm Credit System Insurance Corporation. Uh, while few people outside of the agriculture world may know about this small independent agency that's tucked inside the executive branch, uh, it has an important regulatory role uh, in overseeing the banks and the associations within the farm credit system. The second panel, uh, consist of three CEOs of regional agricultural credit associations uh, within the farm credit system. Uh, created by Congress more than 100 years ago, the farm credit system, which is the largest agricultural lender, provides safe, sound, and rel reliable sources of credit and related services to farmers and to rural communities. Uh, the members on this panel represent large portions of the country from the southeast to the Midwest and will give us a sense of what is happening on the ground and lend a voice uh, to our farmers. I'd like to thank everyone for being here today, especially those who had to travel a great distance to get here. This discussion comes at a very critical time uh, for our farmers, our ranchers, our producers, and for our rural communities. Uh, recent natural disasters across the country, including hurricanes and tornadoes in my home state of Georgia, and unprecedented flooding in Nebraska, the home state of our distinguished ranking member, Mr. Fortenberry, uh, and other uh, disasters across uh, the country and in the territories have created stress and uncertainty on top of the impacts from the ongoing tariff situation. And that's not to mention the fact that farmers have faced years of declining commodity prices. I've heard from my constituents, as I'm sure my colleagues have too, that there's a lot of anxiety. Farmers and ranchers are resilient by nature, but for many, the future holds a lot of unknowns. But to be honest, I didn't think that we'd be sitting here in April without a disaster aid package that had been signed into law. I'm hopeful that it will happen soon, but I'm extremely frustrated, and I'm eager to hear from our witnesses on the second panel who are having to deal with the aftermath of these disasters firsthand. Even with all that uncertainty, there are reasons to be optimistic. As of 2017, the farm credit system had more than $9 billion in outstanding loans for young farmers and more than $12 billion in beginning farmers investing in the future of agriculture, whether it be research or people. It's a priority of this committee, and I'm looking forward to 
hearing more about Farm Credit Administrations and the Farm Credit Systems outreach uh, to these farmers. In addition to making loans, farm credit banks and associations serve as a trusted resource of information uh, for people in agriculture in rural America. They build relationships, offer trainings, support trade associations, and donate time and resources after natural disasters have occurred. Uh, finally, as the chairman of the subcommittee and as a member from a rural district in southwest Georgia, rural development is one of my top priorities. I have a real passion for trying to utilize uh, this opportunity uh, to see that rural America uh, is able to prosper. It should not matter what zip code a youngster is born into or in which his or her family lives. That should have no impact on their capacity or their ability to realize their full potential. I was glad to see that all of our witnesses took time to address the issues of rural America in your written testimony. We will explore this topic further. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today, and I look forward to today's discussion. And I'd like to ask my distinguished ranking member and my friend, Mr. Fortenberry, if he'd like to have some opening remarks. Uh, yes, I would. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for convening this important hearing. Um, good morning, gentlemen, and welcome to the, to the subcommittee. We look forward to your testimony. Uh, I am eager to get an update on the farm credit system and how it continues to play a critical role in providing stable and dependable sources of financial credit for, as the chairman mentioned, the hardworking men and women of rural America. Uh, I'm pleased to see that our chairman, Chairman Bishop, <clears throat> has called the farm credit back uh, to testify here only the second time, as I understand it, uh, before the subcommittee in the last 21 years. So welcome home, and again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your initiative. Uh, your appearance before us is timely as our farmers, ranchers, and producers face a number of threats to their livelihoods, uh, from low commodity prices and tight margins to the externalities born of hard but necessary trade negotiations, as well as uh, the problem of natural disasters and something very often overlooked that is really impacting rural America, the high cost of, of health care. Uh, most prominent in my mind is the historic levels of damage caused by the Platte and Elkhorn and Missouri Rivers to farming and rural communities in my district, as well as certain urban communities, but uh, also the many neighboring districts in the Midwest. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing that in your opening statement. <clears throat> to see the power and devastation of this once in every 500 year series of events, bomb cyclone as it's been called, it leaves an indelible mark on you, especially when there is uncertainty about what both private and public resources will be available to support these communities as, as they recover. So on a related note, I do want to thank the Farm Credit Administration for the public statement that you offered, uh, encouraging credit institutions to use flexibility uh, following the disasters so we can help borrowers get back on their feet. Um, Chairman Bishop, as he mentioned, has also seen this type of disaster in Georgia after the hurricane last fall and hurricanes from previous years. So we're, we are hopeful that Congress can move quickly to pass a disaster supplemental for all of the 2018 and 2019 disasters in order to reassure lenders that the federal government is there to lend a helping hand. Today, uh, we will discuss the function of the Farm Credit Administration within the context of the farm credit system, and uh, you all will touch upon the operations of the budget of the administration, its policies and regulation, and something that I, I think we need to spend a little time on, the worsening financial situation of, in today's farm economy. Um, many outside the agricultural community have little, little familiarity with what you all do and how it plays a critical role in ensuring that America has among the lowest per capita of grocery prices in the world. We overlook this. We are among the lowest in terms of food cost in the world. 
So, w but this also depends upon certain preconditions. Without farmers and ranchers' access to affordable credit, the less, less access we potentially have to abundant and good quality affordable food. So as your testimony points out, the farm credit system remains healthy despite some challenges, including a decrease in net farm income and uncertainty of revenues tied to exports and the impact of these natural disasters. You also point out that, a well, that a, the system is well capitalized and the portfolio credit risk remains manageable. I think this is the key uh, component of this hearing that we need to, to unpack. Uh, agricultural financing is a unique and challenging sector of our economy with uh, certain unpredictable swings in commodity prices as well as land values. So if risk continues to the system continue to rise, the federal government, the farm credit system must be ready to respond. So Chairman Songayer, thank you very much. Chairman Hall for appearing for, before us today, and we look forward to your testimony. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fortenberry. Uh, Mr. Tonsiger, without objection, your entire written testimony will be included in the record. And I'd like to recognize you now for a brief opening statement, and then we will uh, proceed with, with questions. Thank you, Chairman Bishop. Thank you, Ranking Member Thorntonberry. Uh, my name is Dallas Tonsiger, Board Chairman and CEO of the Farm Credit Administration. On behalf of my colleagues on the board, Jeffrey Hall of Kentucky and Glenn Smith of Iowa, and all the dedicated men and women of the agency, I'm pleased to provide this testimony. I would like to thank the subcommittee members and their staff for their assistance during the most re recent budget processes. The resources provided will be critical for recruiting and training highly qualified staff to maintain the safety and soundness of the farm credit system and the Federal Agricultural Mortgage Corporation. FCA is an independent federal agency that regulates and examines the banks, associations, and related entities of the farm credit system and Farmer Mac. Our responsibility is to ensure that the system and Farmer Mac meet their congressional missions for the system to provide a dependable source of competitive credit for agriculture and rural America and for Farmer Mac to provide a secondary market for ag real estate loans, rural housing loans, and rural cooperative credit. For more than 100 years, the system has helped our nation's agricultural producers provide the most abundant, affordable, and safest food supply in the world. The system includes four banks and 69 associations. The banks provide loan funds to the associations, which in turn lend to farmers and ranchers, farm-related businesses, and other eligible borrowers. Of the four banks, only CoBank has retail lending authority with express authority to lend to agricultural cooperatives and to support rural infrastructure like water, power, and communications. The system obtains loan funds by selling securities on the national and international money markets. These securities are not guaranteed by the federal government. Investor demand for all system debt remains positive allowing the system to continue to issue debt on a wide maturity spectrum at competitive rates. U.S. farmers are facing challenging economic conditions. After several years of robust times, many farmers and ranchers are facing declining financial con conditions amid large commodity supplies and weak prices for crops and livestock products. Higher operating costs for labor, farm inputs, and other expenses are putting stress on farm cash flows and liquidity levels. At current price levels, many farmers will be under financial stress in 2019, despite USDA's projected increase in U.S. net farm income, for example, profitability of corn and soybeans enterprises remains well below levels reported earlier in the decade. Adjusting production costs to meet expected commodity prices will challenge many producers. Despite these headwinds in, all the, in the overall farm economy, I'm pleased to report that the system's banks and associations, as well as Farmer Mac, are fundamentally safe and sound, and they maintain a strong mission to carry out their mission. While overall portfolio credit quality has declined compared to a year ago, 
credit quality in the system's loan portfolio remain strong. Non-performing assets totaled $2.3 billion at the end of 2018. While elevated from $2 billion at the end of 2017, the system's loan portfolio continues to perform, perform well. Other factors supporting the overall strength of the system are stable earnings, a strong capital base, and reliable access to debt markets. For calendar year 2018, the system reported $5.3 billion in combined net income, and the system's total, total capital equaled $58.4 billion, $58 billion, up from $55.4 a year ago. Finally, the system's loan portfolio continues growth into 2018. The system's current supplies around 41% of our nation's farm credit. At year-end 2018, gross loans totaled $271.9 billion, up from 5.1% from 2017. I would also note that Farmer Max business volume grew by $717 million to $19.7 billion during 2018, and overall credit quality remains stable with substandard assets and 90-day delinquencies remaining well below historic averages. I ask that my written statement, and I appreciate that you have included. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tanzinger. Uh, your excellent and frank testimony seems to raise at least a flashing yellow light with respect to our rural economy. Uh, which is the subject of our hearing today. You cite a 9% decline in U.S. ag exports in the fourth quarter of 2018, labor availability concerns, net cash farm income that is well below the level achieved five years ago, uh, somewhat lower cropland prices for the rest of 2019, 4% increase in total farm debt, and a rise in farm bankruptcy rates. And I thank you for noting the serious impact that extreme weather events uh, have had on farmers in many parts of the country. Uh, taken together, all of this uh, is very, very concerning. Uh, would you say that we are at a tipping point in 2019? And what would you say are the major warning signs that we should be paying attention to as we go forward? Uh, preparing for 2020? I, I th yes, I think there's great concern, especially related to net fash farm, farm cash income. The, uh, it's that number alone should cause all of us engaged in helping agriculture concern. Uh, I do believe that the farm credit system is in the strongest possible position that I've, in my memory, uh, to help deal with the challenges associated with that. Uh, and that all being said, there's, there's nothing more difficult than being someone in bankruptcy and having to deal with the issues associated with that. Um, I think that farmers grew a general strong balance sheet uh, some five years ago or so when things were quite good. Uh, but there's an erosion of that that's occurring. And uh, I think the early participation of farm credit system uh, loan personnel with producers to help them deal with whether it be the difficulties of farm economy, the, the physical difficulties of the storms that we've had, uh, I think is absolutely crucial. And I think, uh, I think that the system is prepared to engage with producers that way and is engaging with them. Hey, you mentioned uh, USDA's projection of net cash farm income in your testimony. Uh, for my colleagues, I want to point out that it's the Economic Research Service that does this estimate. Uh, my staff checked the uh, Farm Credit Administration website and found that there are many, many citations uh, to ERS studies in your reports and publications. Does the Farm Credit Administration value the independence and the work of the Economic Research Service? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we have a small economic staff, but a very good one, five, six people that are directly 
engaged in the economic issues. They rely heavily on the ERS's uh, work as a check on our own work, as well as uh, an early warning system, if you will, that points to trends that may be occurring. So, yes, we rely on them significantly. I understand that the Farm Credit Act and the Farm Credit Administration regulations require credit programs and annual reporting on young beginning and small farmers. Can you discuss these credit programs? And in today's market, with the challenges that you've discussed, are young people uh, deciding not to go into farming and to pursue something else, uh, given the, the tremendous challenges that we are now facing? Yeah. I, I'm, I, I think that the farm credit system program for young, beginning, and small is probably the best in the country. And uh, it was initiated on a rulemaking in 2000, so it's about 19 years since that rulemaking occurred. Uh, the rule requires that each institution of the farm credit system establish a program to work with their producers so it's identified to their particular regional needs. And so it might be reduction in interest costs, it might be reduced uh, collateral requirements, uh, but each of them uh, uh, enthusiastically embrace this effort to make sure it works. Uh, so they report to us. Uh, we examine them to make sure that they're following the program they've established. Uh, but you may be aware that we have recently put out a notice of potential rulemaking on the 2000 provisions because we think after 19 years it makes sense to re-examine what, what the system is doing in that area, especially the reporting information that we get uh, and hope to improve it. Thank you, Mr. Tonsaga. My time has expired and I'd like to Yield to Mr. Fortenberry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Tonsanger, I have your name written out phonetically in my opening notes, <laughs> but we're going to get to the bottom of this once and for all. Did I say it wrong the first time and right the second time? Uh, well, yes, you just did now. Thank you very much. I've hey, encountered gonna... that issue a number of times over okay. the years. Okay, thank you. But you'll answer to either in case I do that again. Most people just go with Dallas. So. Can, Mr. Chairman, would that be all right? <laughs> um, let's, let's try to reconcile a few things here that are, are being talked about. And frankly, I, I think I heard the answer embedded in your testimony. Um, investor demand for your securities are positive. Yes. Uh, cash flow, farm cash income is down. Yes. USDA predicts a little rosier scenario. Do you or not? That's one question. And then, um, so I think the question becomes, what are farmer debt levels, have they significantly decreased? And you referenced uh, strong balance sheets having been built five years ago. So are we living now off the seed corn, if you will, of a stronger balance sheet, which gives us a better position to weather the net, net income loss at, the, at this time? which then contributes to, again, investor confidence in your securities. Is this a correct analysis? Uh, yes. I think that, uh, uh, you know, our, our, we would agree with USDA's analysis of the income. I mean, we, uh, we don't attempt to recalculate that ourselves. We rely on their calculations when we talk about it. Uh, I think that the farm credit system has done a, an excellent job of building confidence in the marketplace in the bonds issued. So for uh, generations, there's been you know, very little disruption on the, the part of the system relative to the bond markets. The bonds have always been paid. And the bond markets give us one of the highest ratings in the world for the quality of the bond issuances that we do, which is an enormous benefit to all of the, the 500,000 uh, stockholders or that are participants in that. So it's a huge advantage. And the very strong capital position helps us, I think, address some of the issues that are involved with credit and be able to be assured that we can continue to pay those bondholders back, or they can pay the bondholders back on those securities. Well, there, there has to be another dynamic here as well, another variable. I, I would assume that, again, the adjustments of the Farm Bill, the authorized programs that provide risk more robust risk mitigation, 
create the scenario in which, again, the, with the ups and downs of incomes, it doesn't as significantly impact uh, credit risk as it used to. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. I think uh, the crop insurance program and the other risk mitigating factors, as you describe, certainly are are key to all lenders, you know, not just the farm credit system, but others. Without that basis, we would be much farther behind in our ability to help producers get credit. Um, I may bring this up on the next panel, but uh, you're intimately familiar with what has happened to us back home in the Midwest. So how is the farm credit system responding? Well, I, th I think we, uh, the, the strategy we that the farm credit system pursues, and we press them, is to seek the best possible outcome for all producers. I think in looking at a disaster situation or the general erosion of farm income and assets, uh, asset preservation needs to be part of that dialogue with producers. In the 1980s, and I was a dairy farmer in the 1980s in South Dakota, um, people went uh, a long ways in borrowing money. So they, they really wanted to stay on the farm. It was absolutely critical to them. Many, when we ended up with a real crisis that resulted in a tremendous amount of bankruptcies and other factors. So the term that we have pressed the system with and they talk about is itself is trying to seek the best possible outcome for every producer. Let me go back to an earlier question before my time expires regarding debt levels that farmers are carrying because I don't think I got an answer from you in that regard. Uh, there has been an increase in debt level. <coughs> Generally, it's a restructuring process where longer-term debt is taken out and replacing shorter-term debt. And so while the farmer's position still looks good, they've lost some ground in their uh, available short-term Maybe, debt. Maybe in, as you proceed in your testimony, you can unpack as compared to when. I'd like to know the historical comparison. I, I'm out of time, but we'll, maybe we can come back to that. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cuellar, Chairman, thank you, and, and to the ranking member also. Uh, Mr. Townsend, let, let me ask you, uh, in your uh, written testimony, you mentioned the tariffs that the administration has um, imposed on China and other countries, and as you know, they've resulted in retaliatory tariffs on many of the American agricultural products. In fact, I was just sure. communicating with some of them uh, right now. Uh, this has increased price risk for agriculture and key commodities that many farmers grow in my district and across the, uh, the nation. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what the Farm Credit Administration has done to mitigate the negative effects that this tariffs have had on farmers? And, you know, my personal opinion on this, um, you know, I don't want to see subsidies or bailouts for farmers. You know, we went through that in 2009, and some of those folks that were complaining are now getting what they complained about some years ago. Uh, so I don't want to see bailouts for them. Uh, I think the most important thing is to get uh, markets because the way you, you understand the way this works. If they lose a contract to somebody else, they just can't turn on that contract right away. I mean, once they lose that, uh, it might be gone for a while. So I'd rather give them markets instead of subsidies or bailouts. Uh, tell me what y'all are doing on that aspect. Uh, well, I think we're we're being very much aware, you know, and we're we're anxious to to uh, uh, we're anxious to uh, be prepared for the issues associated with that. So, we're credit providers. Or the farm credit system is credit providers, and the the uh, the need for producers is if there are short term issues, and hopefully prices are short term issues. Uh, that the that the system is in a position to help producers get through that difficult time. So, uh, you know, we're following it closely. The system is following it closely. Uh, we're trying to help, or the system is attempting to help uh, producers get through that difficult period while paying attention to their long-term situation. So uh, we know that there's uh, issues that... Uh, you know, hopefully will be resolved regarding uh, trade, and uh, that that'll help producers, uh, you know, move forward. And we haven't even talked about the president trying to shut down the uh, <laughs> the, 
The border, I mean, if you want to talk about economic impact to our ag folks, that would have an extremely negative impact. Uh, every day there's more than $1.6, $1.7 billion of trade between the U.S. and Mexico. That's over a million dollars a minute uh, on it. Uh, so that's another issue because Mexico is a huge um, uh, partner to the ag industry. Uh, let me ask you about um, 2017 uh, Hurricane Harvey, uh, as you know, hit southern Texas, and you know the numbers, and you know the agricultural losses topped more than $200 million. Uh, I you know, really appreciate the good work that y'all have done to uh, support recovery efforts, and if you can just tell me, um, update me on your uh, efforts, and I've heard a, a lot of Good um, thanks to, to what you're all doing, but if you can just tell us where we are right now. Well, I think it, uh, we examined that and discussed it yesterday. Um, the, the farm credit system, I think, when you look at the disaster, of course, you get into all the issues associated with what disaster assistance there was and, and uh, crop insurance and regular insurance. But it appears that that, that whole region that was subject to that has been recovering nicely, that the credit issues have not been extreme. They have not put the association in any kind of jeopardy in that area. And so, of course, there was, I'm sure, cases where producers lost their farms or otherwise. But by and large, it's recovered nicely. Delinquency rates have not gone up dramatically. So people have done their jobs and done their work, and I think it's been very beneficial. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the good work you've done on that. I have a, a defense appropriations, as you know, they're all at the same time. So again, with your respect, uh, I'm going to be stepping out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and a ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Molinar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, um, one of the areas in the Farm Bill of 2018 classified hemp as a commodity. And in turn, it makes it eligible for crop insurance. And some farmers in my district have expressed an interest in growing it as part of their rotation. Um, could you explain what the next steps would be for farmers that are interested in growing hemp in terms of financing? Yeah, I would like to offer some thoughts. In addition, we are prepared to provide some guidance to the farm credit system on exactly that subject. And so, you know, it, it's clear that the the hemp that is low, H, low THC levels under 3 tenths percent is now legal uh, to be produced. Um, the 28 farm, 2018 Farm Bill also established a program to be operated by the Secretary and the states to help the growth of the hemp program. Uh, but in, they don't believe that it's going to be available till 2020, is my understanding. Uh, the Secretary has recommended that people under, uh, operate under the authority of the 2014 Farm Bill uh, that's uh, granted and been out there and available to people to use on a pilot basis. Uh, we have drafted a list of criteria that we are going to be giving to the farm credit system under which they uh, uh, could potentially finance. And I'd like to offer to my colleague here, I know he has great interest in the hemp issue as well. Um, while there's a lot of clarity, there's a lot of uncertainty too. Um, it's not just USDA, but the Food and Drug Administration who's going to have to make some decisions on hemp products. We really see there's sort of three different categories we find states in right now. Some states do not even have state authority to produce hemp, sell hemp, market hemp. Uh, states like Kentucky and uh, several others, I think maybe 20, 25 others, have a pilot project that's been in, uh, in operation since 2014, once it was a pilot project uh, in that farm bill. Those states are moving forward. And then there's sort of a middle ground where um, states don't have a pilot project, they're working to try to develop one. Um, and so we're trying to put out guidance to address all three of those situations. But it is clear, as the chairman stated, it is legal now, and we're trying to make sure that uh, we get the proper guidance out to system um, institutions so they can provide credit to borrowers. And, and you said uh, to rely on it won't be available till 2020? Go ahead. 
I think the 2020 is when we anticipate USDA putting out their regulations. I know they're in the process. In fact, I'm attending a field hearing next week with AMS to sort of get some more information on that. But uh, just given the growing season, something's going to have to come out pretty soon. And I just, I just don't see anything probably this growing season. It's going to be those states that have some pilot project already in place who will be able to uh, produce. But I'm saying that we're ready to provide guidance now to the farm credit system okay. regarding financing. Okay, thank you. Um, also, uh, to follow up on the discussion on some of the trade issues, um, you mentioned in your projections uh, corn and soybeans. You felt that that was going to be down uh, right now. Are you? Uh, how do you account for things? You know, I know China has said they will take more of our soybeans. I don't know where that stands today, but how do you factor in those kinds of considerations, and, and are you doing that? Uh, well, we rely generally on the ERS's projections uh, for those. We study closely. Uh, we talk to the system institutions. Uh, they have policy established for financing, and so <laughs> they, each institution would establish what they think the right number is for the value of the crop in their region and calculations of how they would support producers along with, of course, as we talked about earlier, crop insurance and the other risk mitigating tools that are available. And then when it comes to the USMCA, um, my understanding is that will help uh, open some dairy markets in Canada. Um, overall, does that affect uh, any of your projections and, and are you uh, urging passage of that? Uh, would that be a benefit for the farm economy? Uh, we have provided guidance to the farm credit system regarding uh, what was in the, the farm bill uh, approach for improvement and asked them to look at that closely. Uh, I'm not as familiar with the USMMC. Um, is that something that you would typically weigh in on? Is that something that... Yeah, well, we would, we certainly, uh, it has been pointed out to us by several parties that there is help coming for dairy producers and that the system should allow for that help uh, to be made available and that they, they should account for that in their lending practices. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Adderholt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks. Uh, good to be here today. Sorry I'm a little late. I've had, we've had a full morning. but. Uh, I think most everybody that, that's uh, on this committee, whether you experience it firsthand or whether you've uh, uh, just uh, know about it from uh, your colleagues, that uh, rural America is, is different from uh, urban America. And it's no surprise that rural ending needs, particularly to farmers and ranchers, uh, are also unique. Uh, I am comforted in knowing that uh, there are entities like Farm Credit who understands the needs of rural America. And I appreciate all the work that you do for our producers and uh, for the districts like that I'm proud to represent in, in North Alabama. Uh, financing needs of farmers and rural communities are, are more than any one type of lender can handle alone, in my opinion. Uh, could you talk about your institution, uh, how it works cooperatively with community banks and others in the area to meet the needs of rural communities and, and ag? Uh, yes, there are, I think one of the unknown things is there are thousands of transactions occurring all the time between the farm credit system and community banks in serving agricultural producers. Sometimes there are arguments over the institutions, but they in the field do a significant amount of risk sharing on farmer projects particularly, but also on rural projects. There's quite often a community facility kinds of loans made where the system attempts to be helpful for a community facility and bank, we require that they seek the participation of bankers with them in developing these kinds of projects. And of course the system engages in water, sewer system, broadband communications uh, and tries to participate broadly uh, with other lenders in those areas. So I, I think in general there's good working relationships that occur between community banks and, uh, and the farm credit system. Are there ways to encourage more cooperation that would help meet rural financing needs that you could think of? Uh, yes, I believe so. I think uh, we, we currently uh, provide an individual, the board approves individual projects of the farm credit system in, in, public, in 
community facilities in rural America. And I think more of that could be done. I think uh, they're treated as third party investments. So if a project is coming to finance in rural America, uh, a package is put together that the farm credit system, bankers and others can participate together in. Now, as a former undersecretary of rural development, to be successful, I think, in development in rural America, it's about spreading risk, putting together deals where multiple parties take a piece of the risk, uh, and so it's not too much for any one institution to take. And I think the more that can be done in creating these kinds of participatory, participatory arrangements, uh, the better off rural America is going to be. We need everybody in a rural America participating together and sharing risks together to make sure that there's success because nobody can take kind of the whole risk. USDA is a great example, participates with its community facility programs with private partnerships and, and helping put the deals, uh, deals together. Let me uh, switch uh, topics just a bit. Uh, Alabama ranks uh, third in uh, broiler production, uh, right behind the chairman's home state of Georgia, and then, of course, Arkansas. And uh, my district in Alabama is the uh, most uh, broiler uh, producer in the state. Of course, avian influenza has had a terrible impact on the poultry growers in Alabama. Uh, and Alabama Farm Credit went out of its way to work with producers that were impacted by the uh, last outbreak uh, that occurred in our state. Uh, did your associations have a similar problem? And uh, how did, did you work with producers who experienced losses that I, like those that are in Alabama? Uh, again, I, I, my information that I receive is there is significant e effort by the system to work with any party in these kinds of difficulties. And I think uh, the many years of experience avian influenza is not new. It's been around a while. It's come and gone. And I think that that experience helps uh, the loan underwriting within the system and making sure that they, when they look at these cases, they know that there's a coming out of it. It gets, you get over it, you get on, and you can go on to the next thing. So I think that experience, I think, has given them a confidence and being able to work with producers to help make sure we can keep moving forward and keep financing them and help them uh, uh, make some money, hopefully, along the way. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, let me just follow up on the rural development uh, discussion that we had a little earlier. Uh, as I had indicated, uh, one of my priorities is investing in and giving renewed focus to rural development. And for rural America to, to thrive, we have to close the digital divide uh, between urban America and rural America. We've got to invest in critical infrastructure, which includes roads, bridges, water, wastewater. We've got to improve rural health and rural education. And much of that focus of course, is within the jurisdiction of USDA. But the farm credit system has to play an integral part there. Uh, in addition to providing uh, credit to ag producers, uh, the system also makes loans for rural housing and for rural utilities. Uh, your mission is to ensure a safe, sound, and dependable source of credit and related services for all creditworthy and eligible persons in agriculture and rural America. It's my understanding that in 2014, uh, the Farm Credit Administration ended the pilot programs associated with investments uh, in rural America program. Uh, what lessons uh, did uh, FCA learn from these pilot programs, and are there any plans for uh, establishing similar projects uh, in the future? Yeah. Uh, the, the pilot program went on for several years, and we did learn uh, some issues. And we, of course, you know, during that time, there was strong debate among many about that participation. I think that uh, we, want, we chose to take a route that we felt very secure about it going forward. And we feel s uh, very confident that there is the ability for the system to participate in these kinds of investments. At this point, we have chosen to do it through individual approvals uh, by the board and these institutions, so they continue. Uh, we have 
developed a much more efficient process for imp improvements uh, at the agency on these approvals. And generally, we strive for every trying to do them in two weeks. Sometimes it goes a bit longer. Uh, we are continuing to look at processes that might uh, allow us to accelerate those investments, but we've come to no conclusions on what might be the, the process for that. As I mentioned earlier, I believe that, that uh, it is critical to, in providing credit to institutions in rural America, uh, that as many partnerships can be made as possible. So in many institutions in the system, like to be engaged in those partnerships. So I appreciate your interest in that and we are diligently looking for ways to, to continue to grow that. I would like to add also that Congress authorized the farm credit system to invest in what are called rural business investment corporations and many uh, institutions have taken advantage of that. There's been I think six or seven new investment companies created and the farm credit system has invested significantly in those and is out there involved in investments that way as well. The key to it is is a real robust investment in, in broadband and the internet, because connectivity is going to mean everything for quality of life uh, in, in rural communities. Uh, let me uh, switch gears for a moment and go back to the impact of the lack of passage of uh, the disaster bill, which has been pending now in the Senate since uh, January the 16th. We had volcanoes and uh, the, the damage done in Hawaii, the cyclones in the Mariana Islands, wildfires and mudslides, California, hurricanes and tornadoes in the southeast, the Gulf Coast, the eastern seaboard, the floods in Nebraska and the Midwest. Uh, what, what is the impact uh, of, of uh, the slowness, uh, the inability to, to allow assistance for farmers and rural communities uh, from the lack of, of passage of this. What, how is that impacting uh, the farm credit system and what, is the, what are the prospects that will come out of that? Well, any assistance that can be provided by the federal government or other parties to these people that are affected by this is helpful. And it's not only helpful in the way, uh, in the giving of the grant, it also gives uh, lenders comfort in seeing that help occur. So I think uh, anytime the resources of the government are provided or other parties, uh, it, it has a positive effect. And uh, I can't measure the effect of uh, the lack of approval of a statute. And my time has expired, Mr. Kornberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to go back to a question that uh, Congressman Adderholt hinted at. Uh, many of us receive complaints from the commercial banking sector that the farm credit system has an unfair advantage. Just a rough calculation. You've had about a 20 percent increase in assets over the last five years. Uh, are they correct in saying that the farm credit system has an unfair fair advantage? Uh, I understand the arguments that occur, but I, you know, I would mention a few things. Uh, the farm credit system has roughly 40% of the agricultural credit. The banking industry has roughly 40% of the agricultural credit. The farm credit H system... Is that, is that a recent statistic or that's remained the standard It's variable? been pretty close. It's buried a few percentage points over time. The, uh, the system was established 100 years ago uh, as a cooperative system, so there's 500,000 farmer owners of the system that are the beneficiaries of the farm credit system. The, the uh, cooperative structure generally allows for the profit of the system to be given to the producers who in turn pay the tax on it. Many of the banking industry participate in a subchapter S structure that also allows the profits to pass through to them. The profits of long-term credit lending for particularly real estate are not taxed. And, uh, the banking industry has access to the community banking system as well and get some advantages that way. So, uh, you know, I would argue, yes, there's debates that occur, uh, but by and large, um, uh, this is a 100-year-old institution that benefits producers, and there are uh, offsetting issues in some cases. And I'm not aware of any analysis that's been done in recent times that would compare the two. Thank you. 
Um, regarding beginning farmers and ranchers as well as, as small farmers, um, you have credit uh, available as part of your for portfolio to persons in this category. Would you unpack some specifics? One of the, one of the things that I'm hinting at here, I'll just tell you my, my um, the, pr the pretext here. Uh, we, we have some, something exciting going on, actually, in the agricultural family. Now, we, while we only have a certain amount of land and the barriers to entry for someone entering without connection to perhaps a family or some other institution to obtain a larger scale production ag farm with all of its land requirements as well as capital requirements is, di is diminishing, that's reality. But the ag interest in agriculture, particularly among young people, is growing particularly as there is a convergence of different fields of science, whether that be uh, environmental quality, conservation, uh, international development as all components of providing the necessary um, means toward food security and env environmental security. Um, what's happening is niche markets are developing, uh, small farms that may be direct, direct market to consumers, reconnecting the rural to the urban and the farmer to the family. Uh, as well as all types of value-added opportunities, even cr increasing significant revenue on traditional production ag farms. So one of the in one of the entryways into the ag family again is through some of these value-added opportunities or unique niches. Is farm credit involved in that type of uh, issuance of credit for those types of entities? Uh, yes, I, there's a, a strong recognition of that, the growth of that, the farm credit system. Uh, does provide assistance in some cases to help getting farmers' markets going. Uh, we are all examining closely the LAMP program that was recently <coughs> provided for in the Farm Bill and see some opportunity there. Uh, well, yeah, I think you, I'm glad you raised that because I think there, if, if this dynamic, if you aren't in front of this dynamic yet, that might be an important uh, on ramp. Uh, to y y leveraging the farm credit system to again participate in what is already organically happening, an expansion of the ag family, creating exciting new opportunities. Yeah. I've always been a strong believer in the value added producer grant program. I think that's been a great tool. And, you know, and I've, I've seen uh, projects where the institutions have been involved heavily in it. I think they j make contributions, and you can speak to them in the next panel, of course, about efforts they've seen in their own areas about the evolution of that. And uh, I think it's exciting as well. Yeah. So that was half a question, half a speech. I think you understand the intention yeah. of my speech. Sure. Thank you. Dr. Harris. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I apologize, but we have a concurrent hearings. Uh, and one of the topics I'm going to ask about actually is we just discussed at the last at the hearing uh, uh, with the NIH, and it's the, the uh, CBD issue. And I understand that uh, my colleague has brought it up already, but I, I need we, I needed to dissect this a little further because so, uh, you know, we just had the head of the National Institute of Drug, Drug Abuse testify three doors down that we don't know what CBD does on developing brains right now. You know, you can you know a ten year old can go in and buy CBD uh, items at a store, and it's a little disconcerting to understand that now we may be loaning money to farmers who might find out six months from now, when the FDA regulates it, that there is, you know, the vast marketplace goes away because the, the amount of CBD raised or, or, or grown for the licensed drug is minuscule compared to this huge overwhelming market that could come under tight regulation. So, you got to walk me through this. Why when, it, it, why when this is completely up in the air? I mean, the FDA, I mean, I spoke to the commissioner about this. Uh, they are very close to regulating this industry. If they regulate it, it can fall under the, uh, the scheduling, uh, the DEA scheduling, and could eliminate the market, not, not, for, not for all hemp. Obviously, you still have the fiber product, but, but the CBD market. So how? How are you going to factor that in when you make this loan? Because that crop, I got to tell you, you know, if you're raising it just for the, <laughs> for the, for the rope, for the fiber, uh, it's probably not a profitable crop for a lot of farmers. Uh, and yet we will we'll be, you know, the, the credit association is going to be uh, advanced or suggesting that credit be advanced for it. 
of course, you know, we're, we're it is, it's a combination of issues that we're struggling with. And that is, the this is now a legally available product crop to be produced. Okay, that, that of course, and I'm gonna interrupt you right there because you know, of course, that, that that's questionable because uh, the, the raising of that crop for other than use to make the FDA licensed drug is actually of questionable legality. I understand it's, I understand there's, there's an issue of disagreement on this, but in, the, in that setting, and let me take it back one step. There are other places a farmer can get, can get a loan for, to grow hemp. Is that right? I mean, they don't have to do it through the, the Farm Credit Association, right? Yeah. So why would we, why would the Farm Credit Association wade into that in a period of regulatory uncertainty? Because, you see, the trouble is, is that my farmers who don't grow it now are subject to risk because, you know, we have the, the, the co-op system and all. Now they're subject to risk because of a decision made in Washington that, you know, farm credit ought to be advanced to a product that is of questionable legality. The, my understanding is the statute provides for any t, uh, hemp to be grown of TH3 of uh, point, excuse me, point 0.3 THC or less, which is obviously a very low level involved with it. I fully understand that. That's only the definition of hemp. That, that is a, is a bot botanical definition that separates it from other cannabis products. It doesn't say that you can sell the CBD legally. That, I mean, that's not a corollary of that. So again, my question is, why would FCA wade into this, this, this area of uncertainty? I don't get it. There are other ways. The, these farmers want to get loans. There are other ways to get it. I know they are because the marijuana growers in my, in my state certainly don't get farm credit advanced to them. Is that right? That's correct. Because of the questionable legality, right? Because in Maryland, it's legal to grow the drug in Maryland. It's just not legal to grow it in the United States, right? We are. Well, we How are. is this not analogous? I mean, is the next thing that, that some, someone in your shop is going to say, you know what, some states approve it, it's a, it's, a, it's a profitable product, let's go ahead and lend money for marijuana growth? Well, certainly with marijuana, we're a federal agency and we comply completely with marijuana is still on the list and we aren't touching it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you once again. Cannabis is still on the list on DEA Schedule 1. Read what it says. Read what it says. Cannabis is on the list. Uh, hemp is a cannabis plant. So again, I'm going to say, and again, so I just want to, you and I understand that there, there is a, there is a, 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 a disagreement and, and there, there's question about this going forward. Why would a banking institution, which is what the FCA is, all sense, sense purposes, take a risk on this, on this remaining legal? Uh, the guidance we provide will allow the institutions to set the guidelines. So they will evaluate the risk for themselves, for the institution, and for the people that might be financing it. So they're going to look at the market, which may become overwhelmed with hemp availability, and they'll have to assess that risk. Uh, they, they will look at the marketplace to see if there's a market for it, and they will look at the uh, overall issue that occurs regarding hemp. I was unaware of this particular argument. It's new to me. It's part of the struggle. And it's probably why USDA is moving slower. I mean, they're talking about uh, implementation of the program in 2020. So I suspect there's real considerations going on with that audience as well. I'd also like to allow my colleague to comment if he'd like to. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. I appreciate your honesty and your genuine assessment of our rural agricultural economies, and I want to thank you for your testimony. Look forward to working with you to meet the challenges that we've discussed today. Uh, they're significant, to be sure, but uh, we remain hopeful. Uh, with that, uh, we'll take a brief recess to set up for our next panel, which I hope we can do quickly. Thank you. We'll stand in recess for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, I just you up there. I think it's off.
right, the hearing will, will now come to order, and I'd like to now introduce our second panel. Mr. Hebrink is the president and CEO of Compia Financial in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. Mr. Jensen is the president and CEO of Farm Credit Services of America in Omaha, Nebraska. And Mr. Pointevent is president and CEO of Southwest Georgia Farm Credit in Bainbridge, Georgia. As you can tell, the panel represents a diverse geographic area. Uh, we welcome your insight, and we are pleased to have you appear before the committee today and to give us a sense of what you're seeing back home. Let me ask Mr. Fortenberry if he has any remarks before hearing from the panel. Mr. Fortenberry? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, again, for calling this important hearing. I, I'd rather proceed right to the witnesses. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, let me now recognize our guests for brief oral statements, and then we will proceed with questions. Note that each of your entire written testimonies will be uh, included in the record. Mr. Hebrink, please proceed. Chairman Bishop and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Rod Hebrink, and I am the President and CEO of Compure Financial. We provide financing, risk management, and financial services to farmers and rural communities in Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. You're well aware of the economic challenges facing farmers. The crop and livestock sectors we serve are best described as struggling, impacting farmers of all ages, experience levels, and sizes. In our region, dairy is the most significantly affected with hundreds of dairy farmers exiting business this past year. While commodity prices have always been cyclical, the current downturn has been prolonged. We work with producers through all economic cycles. Our team is actively meeting one-on-one -on -one with farmers to review their financial information to help them better understand their cost of production and ways they can improve their operation. We strive to assist farmers in managing through the downturn to position them to succeed when the ag economy improves. Each of us have farmers who've been impacted by recent weather-related disasters. Heavy snowfalls this winter resulted in structural damage to farm buildings. We've responded quickly, providing 140 farm families immediate grants through the Compere Fund for Rural America. We want them to know we have their backs as they begin the process of recovery. Compere supports the next generation of farmers through our young, beginning, and small farmer programs. We're proud to work with farmers such as Emily, a young organic dairy farmer in Illinois who I described in my written testimony. Compere has a strong commitment to minority farmers. We've created effective partnerships with community and immigrant organizations who recruit farmers and provide training while we focus on lending and technical assistance. We're proud of our successful work with the Hmong American Farmers Association that has resulted in more than 20 new families growing and selling food to area restaurants and farmers markets. Many of these Hmong families live in Congresswoman McCollum's district. Our focus on championing the hopes and dreams of rural America goes beyond our farmer customers. We're concerned about the continued decline in the health of rural communities. Strong rural communities help agriculture thrive. Fresh thinking is needed to sustain these rural communities and agriculture. Fulfilling our public mission includes enhancing the vitality of rural communities. Compere has taken a proactive approach through partnerships with the USDA Community Facilities Program and rural business investment companies. Among the rural areas we've helped is Renville County, Minnesota, which has a very personal connection. Compere partnered with local banks, Ag Country Farm Credit, and CoBank to rebuild the outdated hospital where I was born and provide rural families access to a $24 million state-of-the-art facility. Residents now have access to the quality of care previously available only at great distances. But we didn't stop there. Farm Credit Grants purchased telemedicine equipment, allowing cardiologists in Minneapolis to diagnose life-threatening heart conditions 
real time. This investment will save lives. Compere is one of USDA's key community facility partners with $760 million of projects across 17 states. We thank the committee for your past support of USDA's programs and request your continued support in this year's budget. Finally, a significant challenge to the future prosperity of rural communities is the lack of equity capital. Developing new approaches to attracting investments into rural communities is essential to creating opportunities for agriculture. Compere began partnering on RBICs to address the shortage of equity capital for rural America. Nearly 1,500 potential investments have been identified, representing $7.2 billion in opportunities. On behalf of Compere Financial, and more importantly, on behalf of the farmers and communities we serve, thank you for your time today. As a partner in their success, it's a pleasure to share their stories and the impact they're making each and every day. We're honored to partner with them to champion the hopes and dreams of rural America. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Fortenberry, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Mark Jensen, and I am the President and CEO of Farm Credit Services of America and Frontier Farm Credit with our service territory covering Nebraska, Iowa, South Dakota, Wyoming, and the eastern third of Kansas. I'll refer you to my written testimony, and I'm happy to add a few opening remarks to give you more insight into the challenging economic environment the farmers and ranchers in our territory are working through. Located in the middle of the country, our portfolio is reflective of Midwestern agriculture. Half of our lending is committed to producers concentrated on grain production, and another 25% on the protein industries, primarily beef feedlots, swine, poultry, dairy, and cow-calf production. I will focus my comments on the grain sector. Make no mistake, grain producers in the U.S. are world-class when it comes to raising a crop. At above average yields have helped some producers, but increased volatility in commodity markets has given them a very narrow window for marketing grain at or above break-even levels. Barring unforeseen events, there are no signs indicating a significant change to projected profitability levels. Grain producers with higher debt levels and or those having higher costs to raise their crops have generally experienced losses over the last four or five years. For many producers, these losses have, been, have more than offset profits they may have experienced in, from 2010 to 2013 during a time of higher crop prices. Some producers are running out of options to make adjustments to their operations and are at risk of continued price and weather volatility. The financial outlook for 2019 does not look favorable for crop prices relative to the cost of, to produce these crops, and we anticipate an additional number of producers experiencing credit challenges. This is the time of year that we work with farmers to establish their credit needs for the upcoming growing season. And this is what we know. Profit margins for producers continue to be tight. We also know the projected crop prices for 2019 are at or below break-even level for many producers. What we don't know is when trade agreements may be completed, which would bring needed stability to grain price levels. Of course, we also don't know the weather. And speaking of the weather, ac across much of the Midwest, major weather events over the last two weeks have taken lives, ruined machinery and equipment, caused substantial livestock deaths, destroyed critical infrastructure, and damaged homes and livelihoods. It will likely, likely take months to fully assess the damage, but the need for assistance is immediate. We are mobilizing staff and resources to help farmers and ranchers and the rural communities in which they live. We have a standard disaster assistance program that is tailor-made to work at times like these. Producers impacted by the floods and winter storms will qualify for this program. The program includes more lenient credit standards, deferment of payments, reamortization of loans, and interest rate relief. Our staff is and will be spending a significant amount of time helping individual producers think through their options. We are grateful for the committee's support of the pending disaster bill and urge you to include assistance for Midwest producers devastated by these storms and pass the bill immediately. With spring planting season just ahead of us, the timing of disaster assistance is critical. We urge fast action. Let me close by saying the agriculture industry is very dynamic and is always adjusting. 
There remains confidence in the future of agriculture and that market volatility will improve. In this environment, agriculture needs Congress's continued support for the Farm Bill, the ethanol industry, and the federal crop insurance program. Providing access to the world markets through strong trade agreements is also critical to the viability of U.S. producers. The U.S. agriculture industry is positioned better than anyone to feed the world for decades to come, and we're excited to be a part of that future. Thank you, and I look forward to addressing your questions. Mr. Cordovan. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for what you do for Southwest Georgia, especially as it relates to agriculture and rural America. Ranking Member Fortenberry, my thoughts and prayers are with you and your constituents back home during this time. Members of the subcommittee, I am Paxton Portovant, CEO of Southwest Georgia Farm Credit, which is headquartered in rural Bainbridge, Georgia. On behalf of the association's board of directors, my colleagues, and especially the resilient farmers and rural communities of Southwest Georgia, I would like to thank you for allowing me to be here today. I would also like to thank each of you for the countless hours you've spent on the disaster assistance package for the farmers and communities that are suffering from recent storms and wildfires. In my home state of Georgia, agriculture contributes to more than $72 billion each year to the state's economy. One in seven Georgians work in agriculture, forestry, or a related field. Agriculture is the lifeblood of our local economies. Our farmers create jobs that support local business and industry. They buy food in our local grocery stores. They purchase tires from the family-owned tire stores. They seek and receive care at our small hospitals. They send their kids to local schools, and the list goes on. It is safe to assume that when our farmers struggle, our rural communities struggle. Southwest Georgia farmers are fortunate to grow a diverse mix of row crops, including cotton, corn, peanuts, soybeans, and a variety of vegetables. This is primarily due to soil types, climate, and a consistent supply of well water for irrigation. Such diversification and access to water has his historically provided risk mitigation for both farmers and creditors. However, after several years of suppressed farm income, rising input costs, volatile trade conditions, and catastrophic weather events, many of the customers are now suffering. The benefits of irrigation, excellent soil types, and mild climate cannot overcome these other factors. Since Hurricane Michael, approximately 10% of our loan portfolio's credit quality has deteriorated due to financial-related stress on our borrowers. We expect to see more of this deterioration as we continue to work through the annual operating loan renewal cycle. On the morning of October 11, 2018, our crops were at the mo their most vulnerable state for wind damage. Cotton plants were full of fiber, and pecan trees were loaded to the hilt with quality nuts and foliage. Much of the peanut crop had been harvested, so most of the farmers had turned their attention to the harvest of what appeared to be a very strong cotton crop, one that would allow farmers to take advantage of an uptick in cotton prices while improving their production history for crop insurance purposes. Unfortunately, we were quickly reminded Mother Nature has the ultimate say in a crop's fate. By nightfall, Hurricane Michael had swept through our area and decimated most of the cotton and pecan crop. The storm also damaged ag-related infrastructure and equipment like poultry houses, grain elevators, center pivot irrigation systems. Not only had Hurricane Michael created tremendous adversity for the current production cycle, for, for some farmers the struggle will continue for many years to come. Hurricane Michael's devastating impact on cotton and pecan farmers was felt immediately. Unable to harvest their crops in many cases, some farmers didn't make enough money to pay creditors or make necessary repairs to equipment and infrastructure. Fortunately, crop insurance and farm support programs have provided many of the local farmers with the ability to repay some of their annual input costs. At the end of the day, however, some farmers are still faced with significant cash shortages, meaning there simply isn't enough earnings from their operations to repay all their obligations. Regardless of the situation facing our farmers in rural communities, Southwest Georgia Farm Credit remains committed to fulfilling our mandated mission. We are currently working with our borrowers to finance their operating losses when justified, provide funds to repair equipment and infrastructure, and renew operating lines for the 2019 production cycle. As you can imagine, many of the farming families in our area have depleted their equity and liquidity as they've tried to salvage their operations. Given lower projected commodity prices, lower projected farm income, and volatile trade markets, farmers in rural communities will continue to struggle. Therefore, strong crop insurance programs, farm support programs, and trade agreements remain critically important. But more importantly, it's time to help our farmers. The time for federal disaster assistance is now. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify, and I will be happy to answer any questions from the committee. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Portovan, Mr. Hebert, Mr. Jensen. Thank you again for being here. Uh, as I said, the written and oral testimony is heartfelt, is compelling, and is honest. 
or can each of you just take a moment to respond to or to reiterate or emphasize any of the any of the testimony uh, that you heard from our first panel? Are there any stories or anecdotes that you can share that will help us help me to get a sense of the mood of farmers uh, from your respective regions? And I think we just got a taste of that from Mr. Quarterman. Mr. Chairman, I think I would add that uh, the best way I know to describe it is there's very little room for error in our area, southwest Georgia. Um, you know, given the history, the recent history, I'd say five-year history of suppressed commodity prices, um, on top of the storm, you know, it's, it's a very critical situation at this time in our territory. Um, so I think it's important for lenders like Farm Credit uh, to be there for their customer, to try and work through these times, and we're committed to doing so. Uh, we are looking at loan restructures, um, providing additional working capital loans, uh, financing uh, irrigation repairs and infrastructure repairs and things like that to get ready for the 2019 production cycle. Mr. Jensen, Mr. Hebert. Mr. Chairman, I, Mr. Chairman, I would just make a comment. Um, as we've dealt with both a decline in uh, income, net farm income across the Midwest, particularly in grain production, as well as develop, dealt with a disaster or two over the last few years. Um, I think I would call out the consistency in philosophy between FCA, Mr. Tonsinger and his testimony, and what um, we execute on every day and working with our customers. In terms of they've, they have been encouraged to work with customers, or the agency has been encouraging to work with, with customers through these challenging times, both in terms of the disaster and what we've seen in the grain industry. So I would call that out. It's important as we work with customers every day, which is our focus. Mr. Chairman, uh, both Chairman Tonziger's testimony and some of the follow-up questions had referenced broad statistics from the USDA and, and overall farm income. And while accurate and indicative of the challenges and the stress within the financial sector, it's important for us to keep in mind that on individual producers, the impact can be very, very different. And for those individual producers who are exiting the business, and as I referenced, our, our why statement, our position statement that we exist to champion the hopes and dreams of agriculture in rural America, we understand that when individual farm families suffer, that's a, a suffering and a death of one of those hopes and dreams of individual families. And that's what we're there and who we're there to serve on an ongoing basis to help them through those challenges and hopefully see the uptick in the agricultural economy. Um, Mr. Quarterman, as you know, and as most people probably know, Georgia's famous for peaches, peanuts, pecans, and cotton. Uh, but a lesser known fact is that Georgia is consistently ranked the top of the forestry uh, industry in terms of uh, privately owned uh, forestry. In 2017, uh, the forest industry contributed $18.7 billion to the Georgia economy and supported 82,800 jobs. And the University of Georgia has estimated that Hurricane Michael resulted in nearly $800 million in direct losses uh, to the Georgia timber industry. Can you give the subcommittee a sense of the damage to the Georgia forestry industry? And can you tell us from your perspective how three consecutive years of hurricanes have impacted our Georgia farmers? And reiterate the impact of not yet having passed the disaster bill. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you're exactly right. The timber industry is uh, extremely important to the state of Georgia. And I can tell you, if you took a trek across our territory uh, on October the 10th and took that same trek, about a 40 mile stretch uh, uh, across our area, you would see the landscape looks totally different. And that is due to the significant timber damage in our area. Um, much of the timber, unfortunately, is owned by pri at this time is owned by private individuals, and a lot of our farmers have diversified their operations through their timber operations. Um, so, much of that timber was was put in place as an investment for retirement purposes or uh, to pass along to future generations. Uh, one description I like for timber and pecans is the fact that we consider it to be a generational crop, I meaning it takes many years uh, to grow. You know, it's typically 10 to 12 years before you can generate any material income from a pecan tree, and it's 10, 12, or 15 years before you can generate any type of income from a timber operation. So it's had a significant impact on our area. As for the three hurricanes, you're exactly right. 
Mr. Chairman, uh, 2016 Hurricane Matthew uh, came across the southeastern part of Georgia and really at a bad time, just like Hurricane Michael, uh, really damaged the cotton and pecan crop in that area. 2017, we had Hurricane Irma that came through southwest Georgia, not quite as severe winds, but did significant damage to the cotton crop. Again, it was at a very bad time. And then obviously in 2018 with Hurricane Michael and the significant damage that it did on our uh, cotton and pecans uh, in October. So, My time has expired. Um, Mr. Fortenberry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your questions and your vivid description. I, sometimes when we're talking about balance sheets and debt ratios and deferred interest and loan consolidations, we're in the realm of the abstract. So uh, the stories that point to the significance of the problem out there are always very helpful. Let me give you an idea of what happened in the area which I represent. So we had three 500-year events along three rivers where they basically confer converged. The Platte, which runs from west to east, flowing into the Missouri, the Elkhorn from the north down and south into the Platte, near the convergence of, of uh, the Platte and the Missouri. So you have rain on top of frozen ground, on top of snow, with rising temperatures, causing a slurry of soil and ice that is not absorbed into the ground, smashing against flood control um, barriers, levees, and, and other um, uh, designed uh, uh, systems to protect our communities. So f when it hit the Missouri, the, the, this wave, this tsunami of sorts, uh, couldn't go anywhere except backwards upriver, which then came over the top of the levee system designed to protect off at Air Force Base, which is a significant part of our nation's military infrastructure, which houses, by the way, Strategic Command, which is the most, the place of the most powerful command of weaponry in, in the world. Um, going back upriver, uh, th all along the Platte, as well as the El Elkhorn, where you had levee systems failing, it, it looks like Swiss cheese, according to the Corps of Engineers. Um, the town of Fremont was largely spared, except in the southern portion of it, when the, the, when the Platte River decided to take a new course, going back to the 1940s route that it once had, blowing out 400 yards of levee that I saw. The little town of North Bend had water just coming like fingers straight through the streets. And then up going further uh, um, west, um, south of the town of Columbus, which is 25,000 people, there's a little truck stop called T-Bones. Well, I saw the initial pictures of T-Bones, which had water, water and mud four feet high. By the time I got there, a lot of that mud was out. And I looked at the manager, Fred, and he said, we don't mess around. We're Nebraskans. We get it done. The point of all this is um, there is a real cooperative spirit where I live. And in, in, in America in general, the disasters tend to bring about the best of us. <coughs> neighbor helps neighbor. Local governments have done an extraordinary job of responding. Um, our role here is to provide the backup mechanisms, which when local responses are overwhelmed, um, we're here to help. So can you speak to any specifics in regards to um, some things that you've done? You talked about the grain sector, but the livestock sector is also significantly impacted. Back to T-Bones, they have two boots, large six-foot or so cowboy boots that greet you on the outside. One was found about 300 yards away in Matulka's garage, and the other one about half a mile away on Highway 81. These are big concrete boots, uh, big, big boots, sunken concrete that were just tossed about like toys. Um, so that's kind of amusing, but at the same time, when you see a, a bloated cow right next to that area on the side of the road, and who knows where it comes from, it points to the issue that the ag losses are going to mount. It's almost easier, in a way, to identify the losses in the urban communities because they're dense and the resource mechanisms are right there to begin to count. It's hard, a little bit harder in the ag community. So two questions, Ms. Jensen. What specific examples of what you've already done with persons who are benefiting from your, your, 
your credit portfolio? And second, um, how intense do you see the ag losses rising, or how, how intense will the rise be? Yeah, Congressman, thank you for the question. <laughs> And it has been an interesting week or two, hasn't it? It's, it's a disaster that I don't think any of us were ready for or anticipated. Um, I'm going to start off my response to your question with a, a letter I received actually from one of our customers. And this uh, letter was received on uh, March 25th, so within days after this occurred. And it was after one of our loan officers had already been out to meet with the customer, look at the, some of the extent of the, uh, the damage they've seen and start talking about, you know, what about next steps? And um, this is how we kicked off, uh, and this customer happens to be from Columbus area, which you just mentioned. Um, I am one of the victims of the terrible flooding across the state of Nebraska. It is going to be a long road to recovery. So that's how we kicked it off. So um, we are in the process right now of meeting with many of these customers in these affected areas. We know that there will be many that will be impacted. Uh, we also had uh, many employees impacted. I think we identified 11 employees that had significant damage to their, to their homes. Four of them may lose their homes. So we're dealing with both in terms of uh, customers and employees. Um, there were a couple unique aspects to what happened there, and you mentioned many of them and how all those things converged at one time. The extent of this flooding has probably had something we hadn't seen. Um, this flooded outside of what would typically be some of your river you know, typical flooding areas if you were to get some mild flooding. And then how quickly it happened. Um, you know, it converged all within a day or two. Um, a lot of our customers did not have time to get out there and remove grain from bins, remove livestock from those areas, move machinery and equipment out. So the, uh, the impact is significant. And there are all kinds of estimates, and I know you've seen them too out there, as how, this, uh, how broad this could be. Clearly it's in the hundreds of million dollars, if not billions. Um, what we are doing you know, immediately is um, when an event like this occurs, what we find is the customers need some time just to kind of get their arms around what's happened um, and deal with just what's ahead of them. And then one of the first conversations to start to work with their, with their loan officer, their banker, to start talking about what options they have. So the things that we've done so far is this is not only, as you mentioned, impacted a lot of um, farm producers, but these communities in some degree have been devastated. So. The Nebraska Farm Bureau immediately set up a relief fund. You gotta give them a lot of credit for how quickly they responded to that. So we've made a significant financial um, obligation to that, to the Nebraska Cattlemen's, to the Red Cross, and then also the Farm Credit System has an employee relief fund that we've donated a significant amount of dollars to. Add that up, we've donated about just under $200,000. In addition to that, as I mentioned, we're starting to have conversations with our customers. and. We have what's called a disaster assistance program that is built for these type of situations that um, unfortunately we see them from time to time and we pull that off the shelf, which starts to lay out options for customers to look at, you know, a lot of cases they need to buy a little time. Um, there might be payments coming due here in, Feb in, uh, excuse me, in April or May. So are there ways that we, uh, under that program, defer payments, reamortize some loans, advance some additional dollars under um, low interest loan program to, he to help them. Um, so those are some of the things we're doing immediately and some of the things we've done for the community. And I realize I'm running out of time too. I'm, I'm interested in learning a little bit more about your rural development activities. Uh, rural communities and agriculture are interdependent and the Farm Credit Association has played an important role in financing and supporting rural hospitals, housing, and infrastructure. And as you know, our committee uh, oversees rural development at USDA. Uh, from what you see on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, what are the greatest needs that you see in rural America? And do any of you have experience working with uh, the Rural Development Agency at USDA, and have those interactions been positive? Uh, because what you have to do is for whether it's housing, whether it's infrastructure, uh, whether it's uh, education or health care, uh, you've got to help make it affordable and accessible in order for the quality of life in those rural communities to be uh, uh, improved. Uh, can, you, can you comment on, on that, each yes. of you? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your observations and insights are, are correct. In order to retain population in rural areas, we need many of these amenities, whether it's access to health care, 
uh, jobs, education, and other infrastructure, such as broadband in rural communities, to be able to retain the rural population that exists and the young families, your young, uh, younger generation that is, that is coming up. Compere has been one of the most active farm credit associations within rural development. We've participated very actively with the USDA and those rural development programs, particularly the community facility programs. We've been involved in the, in the development of 40 projects over the Midwestern part of the United States across 17 states, largely rural critical access care facilities, uh, senior living facilities, and other community facilities. We have had a strong partnership with the USDA. Those programs have been essential to, uh, to put into place uh, the financial structure that allows those communities to move forward and finance those projects. It's been a public-private partnership between farm credit, community banks, and the, the USDA programs. And we look forward to continuing to work on those USDA programs on future projects. Mr. Jensen? Um, in addition to those type of programs, uh, at more of a local level, uh, we're involved in promoting various different um, ag programs, including 4-H you know, programs, um, um, the county 4-H level, um, we have a hands and learning ag initiative um, that we are participate in. We provide scholarships for, um, well, it's 32 individuals for $2,500 each scholarships last year, and also, you know, local farmers markets um, like the Fallbrook Farmers Market in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, so those are, you know, various different types of, uh, of opportunities we take advantage of to help rural America. Board of it. Mr. Chairman, I would echo the comments. Um, but I would say that job creation is an absolute must in, in the rural areas, uh, especially in southwest Georgia. And uh, the only way to create jobs and lure those industries to our areas is ensure we have access to quality health care, uh, access to quality education, and obviously, as you mentioned earlier, the infrastructure, including broadband, uh, to create the connectivity we need to thrive. Um, but that is definitely uh, the biggest challenge for our rural area in southwest Georgia. Well. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all of you, all of our witnesses, Mr. Hebring, Mr. Jensen, Mr. Porterman. And on behalf of the committee, we truly appreciate uh, your willingness to come to Washington today to discuss a rural economy and to provide personal on the ground insight of what's going on and what is needed from Congress. Uh, the work that you do is extremely important, and I'm glad that we were able to have you to assist us and discuss this important topic today. Again, I want to thank you all for your testimony. And with that, the subcommittee is adjourned. Okay. <clears throat>